So listen, tonight, man, like I said, we were very excited about tonight. What's gonna happen tonight? We got we got we got a, a, a brother's coming in tonight, man. He's running for the governor of New York State. And I like the way he came in from the beginning, Tom. Swazi came in, kicking the door, waving the 4-4, saying, I'm not down with the BS. So without further ado, my man Jamie, can you bring it out, brother Tom Swazi? Wow. Hey, boom, guys. Thanks for coming through. Thanks for coming hey, boom, through. guys. What's going on, man? What's going on, What's Tom? How you feeling, man? Welcome. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming, man. We Tom, really thanks for coming on the show. We yeah, appreciate man. it. I'm excited Absolutely. to be hanging out with you guys. Yeah, that's what's yeah. up, Tom. That's what's up. Thanks, we don't write too many people. This is like a barbershop, Tom. So, you know what I'm saying? So, you coming into the barbershop, we're going to do some barbershop I talk. I guarantee I go to a different barbershop than you do. Hey, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tom. I haven't really been to the barbershop. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a, it's been a long time since the barbershop was going me, right? Yeah. So, you so, go to the Tom, you in, Tom, you in the library or you home? Yeah. I'm at home. I'm at home. Okay. These are not – these are candy boxes. These are <laughs> – Okay, all right. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, Tom. Tom, you got jokes already. I like that. That's what's good. That's what's up, man. So, Tom, man, these are the brothers. Let's chop it up. And we got an audience here. Who are you? Like, I know you came in the door because I was sitting one day watching TV and I saw somebody say, I'm not the, with the BS up turn. Who the fuck is that? And I said, oh, shit. <laughs> this is the guy running for governor. So I said, like, let me check him out. So who are you, Tom? I'm, uh, I'm a guy who grew up. My father was an Italian immigrant. My mother was uh, Irish and English. She was a nurse. Best people I ever knew, my parents. And uh, <clears throat> I got involved in politics early. I was the youngest mayor in the history of my hometown at 31 years old, Glen Cove, Long Island. Mm. You ever heard of Glen Cove before? You ever hear yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 We, we, knew, we New Yorkers, yesterday. man. We New Yorkers. We, two brothers live in Long Island right there. So oh, yeah. You ever hear of Ashanti? Of course. Yeah. Tom, yeah. Tom. 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 Glen Cove. I went Tom, to Tom, Tom, Tom. Tom. You know, you, Tom. You know we black, right? Yeah. yeah. Right, sure you know this is not a saying, yeah. Tom. I ain't yeah. Yeah. I ain't into the beach yet, man. Go ahead, go ahead. Not everybody oh, knows who Ashanti is. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I grew up in Glen Cove and I became the mayor of my hometown and uh, for eight years. Then I was the county executive of Nassau County for eight years. Uh, I ran for governor against Elliot Spitzer. I got my butt kicked. Uh, didn't turn out too well for Elliot Spitzer either, as we nah, know. Nah, nah, yeah, 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 yeah. He's a little, he's a, you know, he used to hang out with me back in the day, long time ago. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> now we know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> then I, I, I lost my race for re-election of county executive after eight years to a guy named Ed Mangano. Uh, Ed oh. Mangano just got uh, sentenced for 12 years in prison yeah. for corruption and bribery. Mm. Him and his wife, right? With the jail, right? You beat me. Your life is over after that, so you can't. <laughs> <laughs> so then I was back in the private sector, and I worked at an investment banking firm, and then I've been in Congress for the past five and a half years. I'm on the Ways and Means Committee, and I'm giving it up I'm, I'm to run for governor because I'm so fed up. I'm so fed up with the politics of everybody just fighting with each other all the time instead of getting stuff done. I'm upset about New York State. Everybody's leaving New York State. We lost more people in New York State last year than any other state in the United States of America. 314,000 people net out migration from New York State last year because people can't afford it, because the taxes are too high, utility rates are going up, rent's too high, uh, because of the crime that's growing in New York City especially, uh, and because of these kids that are left behind in our troubled schools. Uh, so... And I'm fed up with my own party, the Democratic Party. I'm a lifelong Democrat. You look at all my ratings. I'm a good Democrat. I get all the good ratings. But the bottom line is my party is not talking about the things people care about. And right now, people care about crime and taxes and affordability. That's what they're upset about. And they say, Tom, what are you talking about crime and, and taxes and affordability? Well, that's what Those are Republican issues. I said, no, it's not. That's what everybody cares about. And we got to start talking about it, not talk about it the way they talk about it on Fox News, but talking about it in a real way about how we can make people feel safe in their communities, how people can live a decent life and not be afraid, and how people can afford to live here. So that's why I'm running. That's what's up. So, so Tom, I'm gonna, like, in the last few years, we saw that black women came to the forefront for the Democratic Party, right? To help get a lot of people elected with the black, with the black vote. What now, we're four black men here, and like, what would make black men that like you know, so we won't look at you as more of the same. What will make us want? What will? What? Why would we to go and vote for you? What will make us come? What will? What, what can you do for us? You know, I've got a real uh, 
good relationship with a lot of black men. I appointed a black man as the Nassau County Police, uh, police Commissioner. Mm. And he was from the New York City Police Department. That was in 2002. You can imagine how popular that was in Nassau County in 2002 to hire a black police commissioner from the New York City Police Department. But because he was the police commissioner uh, and he was from New York City, we brought in a lot of ideas from New York City and he pl promoted a lot more black and brown officers in the department. As a matter of fact, the new, new New York City Police Commissioner is a black woman who came up through the ranks in Nassau County and she was promoted by Commissioner Jim Lawrence that I appointed as the police commissioner. Uh, I appointed uh, two African-American men as the deputy county executives for economic development uh, so that because I wanted to make sure my government looked like the people I represent and I wanted to put black men in positions of power so that they could have an influence on making big policy decisions. I appointed a black man as uh, the deputy county executive for parks and public works because they had the most contracts to give out. Because you can make a lot of speeches about uh, minority and women-owned businesses, and you can pass a lot of laws, but unless the people in power who make the decisions are on board with what you want to do, it's not going to happen. They'll always think of an excuse saying, oh, I couldn't find anybody qualified, nobody applied, you know, I, nobody, nobody was qualified, nobody had the, the certification. So you got to put black and brown people in positions of authority so they're at the table so they're part of the decision-making process. And these were non-traditional positions for black men. You know, the police commissioner, deputy county executive for, for economic development, deputy county executive for parks and public works. So every politician says, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. I've done it throughout my career. I, have, I was one of the early endorsers of Eric Adams for mayor of the city of New York, early on. He asked me to be one of his deputy mayors. I said, I'm not going to be a deputy mayor. I'm running for governor. I can do more to help you as governor <laughs> than I can as deputy mayor. So, um, listen, black men, uh, I've had it pretty tough in the United States of America generally uh, because of rates, high rates of incarceration. And you don't see a lot of black men in positions of power in enough of everyday life. And I like to uh, go out of my way to try and identify people that are qualified who can be role models for other people and make a difference. When I was, when I was Glen Cove mayor, the young mayor of Glen Cove, I appointed the first black city councilman in the history of Glen Cove. A guy named Albert Granger. His, his uncle was the head of the NAACP. He's a third generation dentist. A very talented, qualified guy. And he lost his first election campaign. And I said, well, you know, because I was moving another guy to another. I said, oh, I can appoint you again. He said, no, I won't take an appointment. I want to win it. Mm. He went on to run the next time. He was the highest vote getter of any city council member in the city of Glen Cove. Wow. Uh, I just talked to him today, yesterday, actually. Asked him for money for my campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, let me ask you this uh, this question. Um, and I'm a native Long Island. I, I grew up in Massapequa, um, so I'm familiar with Glen Cove. I've always thought there seemed to be a divide um, between upstate New York, the five boroughs in Long Island. Is there a way to kind of rebuild a sense of community just in the state and the city together? You, you know, years ago, used to be always this issue between the governor of, of uh, New York and the mayor. And I know you two are on the same uh, page, but how do we kind of unify to get a sense of community, rebuild communities again at large? Well, first, we got to understand what's going on in the state. You know, we pass a lot of laws in the state that come out of New York City. And we pass a lot of rules and a lot of things to do things for everybody. And New York City can take it because New York City is the economic engine of the world. They can take the taxes and the regulation and that kind of stuff. And the downstate suburbs, Long Island, Westchester, Rockland and Putnam, they're feeding off the mothership of New York City so they can take it too. But you cut off north of Putnam and Rockland County and the rest of upstate New York would be one of the poorest states in the United States of America. They are suffering. I mean, like really suffering, like, like ways we don't know. And if you don't have a college 
or a hospital or a jail or a tourism destination, you cannot survive upstate New York. There's wide swaths of just economic misery because there's just no economic opportunity because the taxes are too high. There's too much regulation and we can take it downstate. It makes it hard down here, but up there they can't possibly survive. So we are losing people from New York state. It was mainly upstate for a long time, but now it's downstate too. When I, I'm, I'm, I'm older than you guys, I think I'm 60 years. I'm going to be 60 years old in August. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're, you're a few years older. You know, uh, our producer is almost old as you. But so, <laughs> whoa, wow, wow. So when I was born, there were 45 members of Congress from New York State, because it's based upon your relative population to the rest of the country. 1962, 45 members of Congress from New York State. Today, there are only 27 members of Congress from New York State, and it's going down to 26 next year because of the census. We're losing relative population. Because everybody who's watching your podcast who's from New York knows somebody that moved to Florida, moved to North Carolina, moved yeah. to South Carolina, moved to Georgia, moved to Texas, moved to Arizona, because they're getting out of here because they can't afford it or they're concerned about the quality of life, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So we got to turn it around. Definitely. Yeah. Tom, let me ask you a question. How do you, you know, I, I heard you in the beginning, you talked about how, you know, your feelings towards the Democratic Party and all the things that, you know, you figured you would do different. Um, how do you convince a black person that has voted Democratic in the past numerous times and feel that their vote is just being taken, but they're not getting anything in return for their vote? Now, I did hear you say about appointing certain people in, in high positions and stuff like that. But how are you going to help the regular guy? What are you going to do to improve his his um, cost of living, his his life, his neighborhood, his community? Well, it's not just black people, but it's everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody's worried about crime right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I talk to families all the time that are are wrecked by by violence. Uh, people that are losing their businesses. People that are afraid to have their kids take the subway. Um, so everybody wants to be safe, and you know, quite frankly, black and brown people are the the biggest victims. Now, there's been injustices for black and brown people too getting arrested. That's why I thought Eric Adams was the perfect messenger because he always fought for racial justice in the police department, but he also was pro law enforcement and said, we got to protect people. So um, I think that that's an issue that's going to be important to, to black people, to all people is, is we got to get this crime under control and we got to do it in a fair way. We have to be more just in how we do it, but we got to make, we have, I have a 15 point crime intervention and prevention plan. On the prevention side, something I'd like to talk about is that we have to help our kids in troubled schools. Because who's the guy from Massapequa? Was that? Uh, Calvin. 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 Yeah. Hmm. So on Long Island, we got some of the best schools in the United States of America, okay? We got great schools, some of the best anywhere. But we also got Roosevelt and Hempstead and Wyandanch and Brentwood, which are some of the most troubled schools in New York State. Right. And these kids have been left behind for generations. And 75% of the people in jail have a drug, alcohol, or mental health problem. 50% of the people at Rikers Island have a learning disability. When we fail kids in school, they do not have a shot to make it later on in life. And I think that most of the dysfunction of our society comes from letting kids down in school. So if you take a good school district, let's say 10% of the kids have a problem, you know, problem at home, mental health issues, you know, whatever, whatever the issue is. And you probably got a family that's supporting them and they got, you know, private health insurance and you got a school psychologist and a school social worker and a school guidance counselor. And you can, you know, help those kids and their teachers and they can figure out the problems with those 10% of the kids. You go to the, a, a troubled school district and 70% of the kids are facing some sort of challenge. The volume of problems is just much higher. And they don't necessarily have the family support in all every instance. And they don't necessarily have private health insurance. And the, you cannot, with the one school psychologist, the one social worker, and the one guidance counselor, address all those problems. Mm -hmm. So my big idea is to take all of our 
health and human service agencies and all of our not-for-profits, health, mental health, veterans, seniors, youth, physically challenged, drug and alcohol programs, and bring them into our schools to help kids at a young age. So that when a teacher says, hey, this kid's having a problem and I just can't deal with it myself. I got too much other stuff going on. You got to bring like a social worker in to help that kid navigate the bureaucracy to find out where they can get services at a young age. Because everybody has heard a speech by a politician saying, it's better to educate a child instead of paying for a jail cell. Well, how come it doesn't happen? Because we don't run things right. We have to focus right. on prevention and take all these health and we spend billions of dollars on health and human service agencies. We spend more per student than any state in the United States of America on our schools. But these kids don't have a shot unless we get them help at a young age to deal with their problems. And kids have to go to school so they're a captive audience. You can find out what's going on in their family as well and help them to find out their problems. To not Because we have the programs, we have the services, but they're all designed for somebody to show up at the window when they're at their wit's end and their life's about to fall off the edge and they're desperate and they're coming in for a check or a housing choice voucher or food stamps or heating assistance, but it's probably too late. Mm -hmm. So you got to try and help them, these kids at a young age to avoid the little problems from becoming big problems later on. That's, that's one of the things I'm most Definitely. passionate about. It's not like the big campaign issue because it doesn't poll well, but it's the thing that I'm like the most passionate about trying to address. Hey, hey Tom, um, let me tell you, I'm the other Long Islander in, 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 in the group. Uh, I'm South Shore Freeport. All right. So when you mention Roosevelt and Hempstead, <laughs> you know. Freeport's not far behind and neither is Glen Cove where I am. Yeah. So, we're you like, know. We're always like number four or five, or six from the bottom. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and you can still get in there. You can, I will, and I want to say that you can still get a good education in Freeport if you try, yep. right? In Glen Cove. Yeah. So, um, but, um, but you mentioned that you mentioned the state of education, you mentioned uh, people leaving New York in droves, uh, uh, the economy, all of these things. And, and taxes, you got to worry about property taxes, property taxes. Oh my God. Let's start, you know what I mean? Right there. And uh, and, I, and you talk about people leaving, and we're talking about people my age and, and our age group, and I'm two seconds, you know, from it myself at times, you know. Um, what am what 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 am I? What's going to keep me in New York? You know, tell me something good about New York. What if you had to sum up uh, what you're going to do? Because obviously you're going to come in and when you become governor, you're going to change some things. You're going to do what you need to do to keep me here in New York. If you had to sum it up, what would you say you're going to do? What's what 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 do I have to look forward to in New York? First of all, New York is awesome and our families are here and we love the place. It's a fantastic place. All over the state's a fantastic place. But we're worried about the crime. Maybe not in Freeport as much, but as they are in New York City. But in New York City, we're really worried about the crime. Uh, you know, people are afraid to take the subway. Certain neighborhoods are, are, are going back to the bad old days. I, when I was younger, I worked in Bedford-Stuyvesant at the Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Housing Project in 1986. I used to take the subway down there. That was a a scary place. I've been at Ben Stuyvesant recently. They, they're starting to have crime problems like that again. I went to a, a vigil the other night for a kid that got shot. But so crime is the big one. Number two is we got to reduce the taxes. We we, we got to if we don't reduce the taxes, people are leaving in droves. We lost what's called the state and local tax deduction. Salt used to be you could deduct unlimited amounts of your whatever you pay in your property taxes and your state income taxes. You could deduct from your federal income. So you don't pay taxes on the taxes you already paid. Trump got rid of that in 2017 because he knew it would only hurt high tax states like New York and New York was never going to vote for him anyway. So he screwed us. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to work to reduce the taxes uh, so that people can afford to live here. Uh, and I'm going to try and help these schools. Uh, so the big three things are crime, taxes, and schools. And I'm going to go after the corruption. I mean, it's just, it's just terribly, terribly, terribly corrupt in New York state. It's the most corrupt state in the United States of America, according to the Washington post wow. last August. Wow. So three governors, past three governors left in scandal, Alan Hevesy, uh, uh, Schneiderman. Then we lost Skello, Silver and Bruno and a dozen other people. Brian Benjamin just got arrested, the Lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. It's because people don't feel like they're accountable. And what I'm running on is that number one, I got a heart for the people. I want to help people. That's why I'm doing this. I want to help people. I'll work with anybody. I'll work with Democrats. I'll work with Republicans. I'll work with progressives. I'll work with moderates. I'll, I, I'm a Democrat, 
I won't change my values, but I'll try and find common ground if you want to actually help people. And I, so I got the heart for the people, but I also have the skill set. I know how to do this stuff. I know how to, I know how to run government. I'm trained as a lawyer and a CPA. I was the mayor. I was the county executive. I was in Congress. I know how to do this stuff. So I want to get stuff done. And Tom, before we go to the comments, I got well, uh, well, uh, one more question for you. And also, see, why Elliot's not there, I told you, Elliot and I used to hang out back in the day. We said, me, him, Benjamin, we used to all get up, get to the club together. So I know those guys. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but no, real quick, but you're saying, like, up, really, uh, the rural areas are upstate are really bad. But now with the technology changing now, that we're going green. Now, do you think, like, when you talk about investing in schools, schools now teach kids to go to college and they'll start getting college ready. I think we need to change that to go to vocational training, vocational Absolutely ready, right. and, and they'll create more jobs. We're going to grow green jobs, the skill set, skill jobs. With that, we saw in the pandemic, Rodney and I and, and Kevin was getting our houses done during the pandemic. It, to get skilled labor is very hard. So, yep. well, where would the investment be back in the schools for vocational training? And also, if you go green upstate, will that transfer to the urban areas of New York City to teach their kids in New York City area where the crime is up and to give them better options? What did, do you have a plan for the going green and the technology? What's going on now? Well, let me just say, let me just back up a little bit about the whole getting skills, okay? 60% of Americans and 66% of New Yorkers do not graduate from college. We have treated people who don't go to college like they're second class citizens for I don't know how long. Now, we should encourage people to go to college. I encourage my kids to go to college, go to college, go to college. But most people, 60%, do not go to college. They don't graduate from college. And you can get a good job and you can make a decent living and enjoy your life by being a plumber or a carpenter or an electrician or getting a, a skill. And we used to have BOCES was a big deal. We used to have wood shop and metal shop and yep. automotive. I was just yep. with a car dealer today. They can't find enough people to work on the cars in the service bureau. Yep. You can make $100,000 a year as a car mechanic, easily, more than that. You could make you could make one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year as a welder. So we got to stop looking down at people and stop discouraging people from doing trades and doing jobs. You know, you could become a computer programmer, quite frankly, without going to college. So we got to train people for the jobs that America needs. We see these stories in the newspaper all the time: millions of jobs unfilled. And what do they want to do? They want to try and import people from other countries to come in and do them. Car dealer said to me today, he said, oh, do you think we could get people from Ukraine to come over and work as our car mechanics because we can't find people to be car mechanics? I said, well, it's, it's a nice idea, but we really should be training our own people. Why don't you hook up with the Glen Cove High School? I'll try and put you together with them. Why don't you start getting kids interested in becoming car mechanics and getting a $100,000 job and start training them now? Right. Mm -hmm. Develop a pipeline. Go, yeah. go to the... Go to Westbury School District where you got a, a BMW dealership and go to those kids and teach them how to become car mechanics now. They'll have a great life. You know, America used to be based upon the idea, I'll work hard. In return for working hard, I'll make enough money so I can have a place to live, I can educate my kids, I can have health insurance, and I can retire when I'm old without being scared. So many people work hard, they can't possibly make it. The minimum wage is fifteen dollars an hour. I may have an idea for you, Tom. Yeah, I got it. Well, these companies to come back here, right? They give them a little bit of tax breaks to come back to the state, but they have to invest in our schools. They have to have internship programs for these young people. If they have to go to, if they go to get another certification or uh, uh, degree for the work for them, they help them get scholarships to pay for them. But they have to come back if they want to do business in New York State because we still got billion, a million some people, seven million, eight million people still here. So whatever it is, 10 million. 18 million. 18, 18, 18, 18, 18 million. I'm sorry, million. I'm thinking about New York wow. City. I'm sorry, I'm 8 thinking about New, New York yeah, City. 8 million New York State. Yeah, so they, they might have to use it. Tom, I might have to come in your campaign, man. I might have to be on your team. But anyway. You're hired. A dollar a year. <laughs> a dollar, dollar a year. year. A dollar a year. Damn, Tom. <laughs> you don't make me have to go back to my old days into the streets. You try to keep me off the streets, Tom. You try to keep me off the streets. But I'm it. But, no, but um, gonna, you know, we need to do, you know, the, the building trades. Carpenters, electricians, you know, plumbers, welders, iron workers, all that stuff, which have started to do a better job of including more black and brown people. They got to do a much better job. Electricians are very good at it now. Um, they have the idea of the apprenticeship programs. We have to, when you said the idea of an internship, it's got to be an apprenticeship program. You get paid, you earn while you learn. 
to incentivize kids to do these jobs, you'll make some money while you're learning how to become expert in a skill. So uh, that's the way to do it. You gotta, because the more you learn, the more you earn. But then if you give a way to earn while you're learning, it makes it even more attractive. So you, you, I, I adopt your idea fully. Yeah. Tom, how do you uh, think the current governor is doing? Terrible. She's failing. Uh, okay. I'm running against her. I, I, mean, I know that. I mean, you obviously don't think she's doing a great job because you're running against her. 91% of New Yorkers, 91% think that crime is a serious or very serious problem. 69% of New Yorkers say she's failing on crime. Why is she giving the mayor the stiff arm? He wants to try and do something to address the crime. He's asking for a change in the laws. She's not even talking about it. Mm. Okay? She just did this Buffalo Bills deal. She announced it four days before the budget was due to give a billion dollars to a big developer that happens to be a big donor of hers. A billion dollars. And it went through no public hearings. You know, I'm all for the Buffalo Bills. Great. They're the only New York team that's left. It, 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 you know, the Jets and the Giants are playing over in New Jersey. We love the Buffalo Bills. But why should it be the biggest taxpayer giveaway in the history of the NFL? They should have not done it out in the suburbs. They should have done it in downtown Buffalo and given the developer a chance to build restaurants and shops and offices and housing, and they could make money off of that, and then they could pay for their stadium with that money. Why should the taxpayers be putting up a billion dollars for eight home games out in the suburbs? It doesn't do any economic development. doesn't do anything for the rest of the state. So... Uh, you know, the, the Brian Benjamin thing that she picked this guy, he had stuff swirling around him. She found out stuff about him and she still pushed it through. So uh, yeah. whether it's crime, Buffalo Bills, the budget, not even talking about fixing the tax problem, she's failing. Damn, you want to go some of the comments real quick? There you go. Uh, Sandra Cummins asks, uh, it, uh, she says, any plans to increase or sustain the current $2.5 million, uh, million mental health uh, school's budget, uh, early intervention is key. I agree 100%. Early event intervention is key. And let me tell you something. Mental health is real, okay? There's like 18, 19 million people in New York State. One and a half million people have a serious mental health issue. I'm not talking about like anxiety, nervousness. I'm talking about schizophrenia, bipolar, or severe depression. A million and a half people. And the people that have mental health problems that aren't taking their medication... They're the ones who are homeless. They're the ones who end up doing drugs or drinking that to, to compensate for their mental health problem that ends up with being in jail. Their mental health problems, drugs and alcohol, are a result in a lot of crime, poverty, homelessness, domestic violence, and all the other societal dysfunction. And it's very real. And we have to address it in a more comprehensive way. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Nikisha, human service workers are greatly ignored, sometimes facing the same challenges as their clients. Uh, how can you help human service workers make a COLA permanent and automatic every year? I got to tell you, that's one of the scariest things is when you got somebody who's working in health and human services and the person on the other side of the window is they're, they're one step away from being in that position. That And they're... they're, they're, and they're they're mad and they're, they're why is this person? It, it, it doesn't result in good client relations. Right. Uh, and uh, the purpose of a salary is, attract, is to attract good people to the job. The salaries in positions like that have to be competitive. And quite frankly, many civil service workers in health and human service positions have less power than a lot of other public employee unions. So, you know, you guys are from, the two of you guys are from Nassau County. You know, the, we know the cops are paid like an extraordinary amount of money on Long Island, okay? Now, I support the cops. I believe in the cops. You got to go after the cops that break the rules and make sure they don't break the rules. But the salaries on Long Island are like some of the highest in America. So when I was county executive, I used to battle with the cops about their salaries because I we had a big financial crisis and we had to save money there so we can use it to fix up our health and human services. So you, we got to, we can't, if we, if we never gave a raise on Long Island to the police officers, you'd have 20,000 people apply for the G job every year for the next 10 years 
because everybody wants those jobs because they're paid so much money and it's public service. I mean, there's probably more morale problems now than there used to be, quite frankly, because of all the anti-police sentiment that, that's, that's out there. But civil service, social worker jobs, it's hard to get people to fill those jobs. That is the best and the brightest. You know, just being a, a do-gooder only goes so far. You got to yeah. pay people a job that makes them want to do the job and want to help the people. That's right. Yep, absolutely. Folks, we got there. Oh, so let me ask you a question, Tom. Um, but the big talk over the last few years, last few years, especially since 2020, was about reparations for black people. We see that other states are doing these studies. Would, well, if you become governor, will you allow there to be a study of reparations for people that was affected in New York State from slavery? And when the, the studies come back of seeing that it's the founder that people should get reparations, will you be willing to pay our reparations? I'm, I'm looking up with the bill is, I, I am a co-sponsor of the bill in Congress on the Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for African Americans. I'm a co-sponsor of that bill. I quite frankly think it should be done at the, at the national level, uh, but it's unlikely that we'll get the votes to do it at the national level, because even if we pass it in the House, we will never get it done in the Senate. So I would consider doing it for New York State specifically uh, to, to study the issue and figure out what the impact is. But I think we should really do it as a national level. No doubt. Hey, listen, uh, we got a big thing that's happening now with Roe v. Wade. All right. So that's a big thing. Um, I know right now, just just a question. Do you think that there's something that we can do um, with regard to it? Um, is there is uh, maybe adjusting the number, something as opposed to saying adjusting the number of justices on the Supreme Court? Is there something that we can do with um, restrictions or abortion rights or anything like that? Um, it's unlikely you're going to get any laws. We, they just had a vote today in the Senate. The House passed a law months ago to to take the was the law under Roe v. Wade and make it legislation. It was passed in the House, but you can't if you pass it in the House and you don't pass it in the Senate, it doesn't go anywhere. So they voted on it today and they voted against it in the Senate. All the Republicans and a couple Democrats too, or one Democrat voted against it. So we're not going to get it changed at the national level. Here in New York State, we have very uh, robust protections uh, at the state level. And, uh, you know, the idea is, is that, you know, abortion has to remain safe and legal and accessible. Um, you know, my mother was like, you know, a woman went to church every day and uh, Catholic. And I, I, she's passed away now. She was the wonderful woman. She lived till she was 93. But she was a registered nurse. And I used to talk to her about the issue of abortion. And she, you know, she didn't really want to talk about it. It's kind of uncomfortable. She's a Democrat. And, but when I push came to shove and we discussed it in detail, she would say, I don't want to go back. To, she was a registered nurse. She said, I don't want to go back to the day when those witch doctors were, were ruining young women's lives. And that's what it's really about. It's about, you know, even if you make it illegal in certain states, People are still going to have abortions. So it's got to be safe and legal. So, do you, yeah. Do you see it as more of a medical uh, concern or a personal rights concern? Personal rights concern. Hmm. You know, I heard someone say today, uh, a woman told me today, she said, I'm not pro-abortion, but I am pro-choice. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I wanted to ask you a question I, right let now. Just, let me just say one thing about that. Mm -hmm. I want New York State to also be a leader in preventing unintended pregnancies. Because abortions come from mostly unintended pregnancies. So we should be working as a society to have less unintended pregnancies. And that's through education and contraception. So we should be educating people not to get pregnant if they don't want to have babies. And that's just, you know, we got to fight it, for, fight it from that way first. I agree with that. Let me, let me ask you, uh, Tom, right now, maybe in my lifetime, I think probably the greatest divide between citizens and politicians, you know, the reputation of so many people. But the Trump administration, I saw a shift when it came to the way people campaigned, um, the, the different rhetoric. It seemed like people became, um, there was more of this visceral disdain between the parties. Um, how do you think uh, the, the last, you know, four or five years has impacted, um, probably the last six years has impacted um, politicians and, and politics at, at, at large? Made it much, much worse, less civil, 
uh, just really much more base, you know, base by just gross. Um, you know, Hakeem Jeffries used to say, he said, uh, he says, not everybody who voted for Trump is a racist. He said, but every racist voted, voted for, for Trump. Trump. That's right. And so it's like, Fair point. You know, he just said a lot of mean stuff that, you know, I mean, leadership, I would have never said this when I was younger because I wouldn't have thought it was too simplistic a saying, but I really believe it. Leadership matters. How the president conducts themselves impacts kids, impacts people. If the president can do it, anybody can do it. And it's like, you know, just everything was name call. You know, listen, a lot of stuff he said was funny. You know, with he come up with clever names for people and stuff like that. But it's like, it's gross. We just debased our, the way our whole discourse was. And it's like, it was just, it's too much. It's, 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 it's had a tremendously negative impact on our level of discourse. And it should have something to do with qualifications too, right? I mean, we have this thing where we have celebrity, people want celebrities in office for whatever reason, but the stakes are too high. You should be qualified if you're going to, I, I always said, I don't think your first job in politics should be the highest office in the world. Listen, my whole campaign, I said, I want you to look at three things. One, who's a proven executive, okay? I've got the experience, I know how to run government. I, I, I've done it, I did my hours, I know, did my 10,000 hours, I know, I know how to run government. Two, I'm a common sense Democrat, and three, I'm running on the issues. But that first one, proven executive, I know how to run things, because I, and I run, it's not like, they say run government like a business. Government's not like a business. You can learn things from business about organizing things and holding people accountable and you know organizing things. That's very helpful. But you know what? In business, you don't have to worry about your opponents trying to cut your legs off every day. You don't have to worry about opening up the newspaper every morning to find out what they're writing about you in the newspaper. You don't have to, the same civil service and, and, and union rules. You don't have, you know, in politics, in government, if you give, say you have a worker who comes in early every day, stays late, answers the phone politely, stays on budget, comes up with new ideas. If you give the person a bonus, they say Swazi gives money to crony. If a person walks up to you in the hallway and says, hey, Mr. County Executive, you stink. I'd never vote for you. You're awful. You fire that person. You get a lawsuit for political discrimination. So that's not like business. You can't incentivize people with bonuses. You can't fire people for being jerks. So it's a very different breed. You have to have a skill set to know how to do it. Time. So. Let me make sure I know we over your time. So you got a few more minutes. To... Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Oh, you with us? Okay. All right. That's what I'm talking about, right, Tom. Let's roll. So let's roll. All right, Jamie, can you bring up a couple of questions? I want to make sure we get people in the audience. That I see that. They, go ahead. There we go. All right. He says, what is your position on the Second Amendment? 14 million gun owners and a half are black women. Uh, we want to be able to defend ourselves and not be treated as criminals. Very heavy duty. So, listen, I believe in the Second Amendment that you're allowed to own a gun. You're allowed to own a gun to go hunting. You're allowed to own a gun to go for self-defense, that's the law. I mean, that's the way it is. But we have too many guns in America. We have more guns than people in the United States of America. And the proliferation of guns is a lot, is because of the, is a, one of the factors that results in so many people getting killed. Because, you know, if you have access to a gun so easily, there's going to be more kids shooting kids, gang members shooting gang members, people losing their temple and shooting their spouse. People having an accident in the house and shooting themselves, shooting their brother by accident. I mean, it's just there's just too many guns. But uh, you know, the status quo. The problem is, is that I've talked to a lot of like back, every ninety percent of Americans believe we should have background checks. Okay, any normal person says we should have background checks so that people with mental illnesses, people who have had felonies, people that you know. Should, certain people shouldn't have guns, okay? We have to have background. Terrorists should have background checks. 90% of Americans favor it. You talk to one of my Republican colleagues, even if they're like normal, good people, and you say, listen, 90% of the people want background checks. You got to vote for that. I said, I can't. I said, why? I'll lose in the primary. Mm -hmm. The problem is, can I, can I talk for a few minutes? This is a very important Absolutely. point. Absolutely. Yeah, bro, you got, you got all the time. You got all the time, brother. There's 435 seats in Congress. Mm -hmm. Of the 435 seats of Congress, 380 of the seats are safe seats. You can't lose because they're, the districts are drawn. They're gerrymandered 
They put all the Republicans over here. They put all the Democrats over here. 190 Republican seats, 190 Democratic seats, not exact, but around that, are safe seats. The Republicans are going to win the Republican seat. The Democrats are going to win the Democratic seat. You can't lose. That's why Congress has a 15% approval rating, but 90% get reelected. How can that be? So it's because they're in these safe seats. The only way, you, so when you're in a safe seat, you don't listen to the people. You don't have to listen to the people. You're not accountable. It's one of the biggest problems in politics. People are not accountable. That's why we have so much corruption in New York State. The only way you could lose the safe seat is by losing a primary. Nobody votes in the primaries. Less than 15% of the people vote in the primaries. Who does vote in the primaries? For the Democrats, it's the far left. For the Republicans, it's the far right. It's the extreme fringes that vote in the primaries. So the people in the safe seats who are only worried about losing a primary, not worried about losing the general election, they pander to the extremists. When you hear the crazy stuff that some Republicans say, the cra some crazy stuff that some Democrats say, they're pandering to the small groups of fringe people that are controlling the elections because they're the ones who are voting. The key to getting people to listen, to get the politicians to listen to the people, the key to getting some, some people working together, forcing them to work together, is for the people to vote, especially in these primaries, because it would force the politicians to listen to the people. So when I say I'm a common sense Democrat, they say, oh, you know, and you're talking about crime and taxes. That's what the people care about. The problem is most politicians don't think you'll win in a primary based upon that because the fringes don't want you talking about crime and taxes. So uh, so we got to get the people involved. What, what am I doing on your show, okay? What am I doing on your show? I'm on your show because I, I know you got normal people that are watching your show that are care. They care. They wouldn't be, what are they doing at 10, 12 at night listening to your show? <laughs> what are they listening? Because they care. Yeah. But they're not political hacks. They're not the people that are part of the system, part of the establishment. And I'm trying to get them to say, listen to this guy, Tom Swazi. He's like a regular guy that wants to help people and do the right thing. I need you to help me. If you hear me and you say, oh, I like this guy, Tom Swazi. He seems like a good guy. I need you to tell your friends and tell your neighbors and get people to vote on June 28th in the Democratic primary, even if you don't normally do it, and help me to win. Mm -hmm. If you hear me and you say, I don't like this guy, that guy Tom Swazi. I came on to here to the, the, the let's chop it up and who's this white guy? What's he doing? I don't like this guy. He's no good. Then just keep it to yourself. Don't say that. <laughs> now we're going to tell, tell the people you are, you are albino. <laughs> 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 now, uh, uh, real quick, so I got I got two more questions for myself personally. Here, so um, like we were talking about business and growing, like one thing we saw, like the most uh, the entrepreneurship, right? And the people that grew up in entrepreneurship and are doing very well in entrepreneurship is black women. What are your goals of building black businesses in the state of New York? That uh, and, and and if you look the governor, you know, the state of New York has a tremendous amount of money. The government, okay, one of the biggest, but it's too big, quite frankly, but. It's, $220 billion. We give out a lot of contracts to people. We have to make sure that when we give out contracts with government money, we're giving it to people who look like the people of New York State. So you have to make sure we're giving out contracts to minority and women-owned businesses so that you can build businesses using that power of the government contracts. In addition, there's a guy named James Sanders, who's a senator in Southeast Queens, no, He's yep. talking about a, a that's, what, that's where I live at, Tom. I'm in Southeast. Go ahead. My mother grew up in St. Albans. Oh, she's so around the corner. Tell us what's yeah. up. She went to Andrew Jackson High School. <laughs> she went to Jackson. Your mother yeah. can fight. Your mother can fight. Jackson, <laughs> Jackson was rough. Your mother can fight. Your mother can fight. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So uh, he's got an idea to do a, a public bank. So take some of the deposits. Take a hundred million dollars, two hundred, some number of state money, and deposit it and create a public bank. And the mission of the public bank is to provide financing for minority-owned businesses so they can get government contracts, so they can build up the business. Because a lot of times access to capital is a big thing that stops black and brown businesses from getting off the ground. Same thing with home ownership, same thing. With, so, so create a public bank with government money. Even get private minority-owned banks uh, or credit unions to run it 
run it for you, but use state money to, to create a mission of getting black and brown businesses off the ground. Um, my next question, and then I'll let the brothers ask more questions. Now that the laws, we see now the laws have changed about marijuana. See the people now, Jersey's getting all that New York money. Everybody's over there going over there to go buy weed. And like and nowadays, I want, I, I'm, I'm for legalizing marijuana because I, I believe that the street weed now is killing our young youth with that fentanyl and all that kind of stuff. They mix it in the drugs. What is your plan on supporting people that were incarcerated because of weed and now they want to get into the marijuana business, but they make the, the, the cost to get into the marijuana business is astronomically high for, for people like myself. or I'm, I'm never been cause but I'm talking about people that look like me to get into this business. What's your plan on that? And do you, are, you for, are you for legalizing marijuana industry in, in New York State? I'm for legalizing. I've actually voted for it at the, at the federal level because it's, it's all a mishmash throughout the country right now. Um, you know, I'm concerned, like a lot of people are concerned that it, it's going to be, whether it's going to be a gateway to other drugs or not. Um, but the problem with, with marijuana arrests over the years is a lot of black and brown people were arrested and a lot of white people weren't for the exact same uh, possession. So we got to figure out how to, by legalizing marijuana, you're decriminalizing it. You're going to keep a lot of people out of jail for low level offenses. Number two, you got to try and help people who got caught up in that system to make have a better life. Now, I don't like the idea of, of uh, helping dealers and people who had massive quantities getting a, a break, but I do like the idea of helping people who got possession uh, of fences getting, getting a break. And the public bank I'm talking about could be used for the exact same thing. Okay. So, um, sorry, I'm going to tip anybody who tells anybody had another question. Yeah, I'd like to ask this question. We talk about people leaving New York. And some of my closest friends uh, graduated on uh, Amityville High. Uh, most of them left, I would assume. Is there any way to bring people to our state, to our city, create, you know, new economic jobs, technological jobs? Is there, is there a plan for that, something that you would think of? We got to reduce taxes. We got to reduce regulation, and we got to create more connections between the city of New York and the rest of the state. You were talking about that earlier, so that you can take some of the. So, like for example, okay, someone just told me I'm going to Buffalo this weekend. Okay, Buffalo's got a major crime problem. Uh, uh, Rochester has a major crime problem too. You should know. Um, but I'm going to Buffalo this weekend, and there's a Bangladeshi community. We're like 100,000 Bangladeshis left Queens and moved to Buffalo and took over neighborhoods that were just completely wiped out. And they like bought houses at foreclosure for like $5,000 and it was $10,000. It was $40,000. Now it's like $80,000. But they turn around these communities. We need to create, be creating connections between the city and these other places in the state where things are very affordable by comparison as far as uh, land and houses uh, and even property taxes, which they'll say is too high up there, but there's nothing like they are down here, uh, and create jobs in those areas where you connect the entrepreneurs uh, to those places in, in high skilled, high tech, but also in basic manufacturing. But those businesses will not locate there if the taxes are too high or the regulation is too over overwhelming. But you got to create a connection between, the, I believe, the city and downstate and upstate. Because it's big. I think the best opportunities for the future of New York are actually north of Putnam and Rockland County. Because the land is cheaper and there's great open space. And there's old, beautiful cities that are just derelict now that have just been abandoned. Gotcha. Mm. So, Tom, I'm gonna go, before I'm, I'm going to let you wrap, i got one last question. I'm going to name your sports teams. Islanders or Rangers? Islanders. Yankees or Mets? Mets, 100%. My son is playing for the Brooklyn Cyclones right now. That's what's up. That's what I'm a big baseball fan. Nice. nice. Giants, Jets, or Bills? Well, I grew up a Jets fan, but I got to be a Bills fan now because they're the only ones in New York. <laughs> hey, can you bring them back? Can you bring our teams back? The Jets and the Giants? I thought at least it's up. Just Let's the bring. Jets. Just the Jets. Yeah, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think I can pull that off. <laughs> <laughs> Knicks or Nets? I'm, I'm, you know, I grew up on Long Island and uh, Dr. J was out here when I was a kid growing up. 
Yep. But I've been a Knicks fan for the past probably 10 or 20 years. So, Tom, you're going to have the final word, final say. Let the people know where can they find you at what you need to do for Sent. Listen, I really appreciate your campaign. The to be on your show. Thank and, you. Uh, listen, I just want to, I want to, I'm giving up Congress. I could stay in Congress for a long time, probably get reelected. And I'm giving up a very prestigious, important job, great honor, great responsibility. And I'm, I'm running for governor on a long shot to try and turn the state around and try and help people, to try and help these families who can't pay their bills, to try and help these kids getting left behind in school, to get to, try and help these folks that are getting ripped apart from crime. Uh, I, I, I'll try and help the mayor in New York City to do the things he wants to do. He's getting held hostage mm -hmm. up at the state level. Uh, I, I want to just do the right thing. I've got a great running mate. His name is Diana Reyna. She was a city councilwoman in, the, in Brooklyn for 12 years. She was a, a deputy borough president to Eric Adams for four years. Her husband's a lieutenant in the New York City Police Department. She got a good heart. When she's elected, she'll be the first Latina ever elected statewide in the history of New York State. And we just want to help the people. And we're fighting against the, the machine. And I need the people to help me. I need the people who are watching this show to please, if you like what I'm saying, spread the word. And like I said before, if you don't like what I'm saying, just go to sleep and forget about me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. So listen, I really appreciate you. And uh, please, set June 28th is the day to vote. June 28th, Democratic primary for governor of the state of New York, Tom Swazi, S-U-O-Z-Z-I, -Z Swazi for NY. That's got a great. heart for people. It's got the skills to get the job done. Tom, you got a website you want to tell us about where to donate money to and stuff like that? Swazi for NY. Swazi is S-U-O-Z-Z-I. -Z Swazi for NY. Are you on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, anything like everything. that? Everything. Well, everything. All everything. Right. Just your name, Tom Swazi, we'll find you. Everybody, yep. people can find you. Okay, cool. Tom, Tom, listen, man, we thank you. We appreciate you. Like, to give it to the people raw. That's what I think everybody likes about you. And I truly appreciate you coming on our show. Um, we welcome back. When, if you win after June, if it goes to the past of you, you know, we hey, will be there for you, brother. Thank it's you a big brother. deal that you guys let me on for as long as you did, and I really appreciate it, okay? Thank you for okay. your time. Oh. Thank you for your time, man. Appreciate you, man. Good night, dude. Thank you, Peace, 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 peace. Appreciate you. Appreciate right. you.